Hey everybody, I got something new and exciting to share for you today. It is the two player starter set designed by Death Ray Designs and myself for Steel Rift. Okay, so what is Steel Rift? Well, back in 2020, 21, um, Austin from Death Ray Designs and myself started talking about what it would look like um, to do like a collaboration and what that might mean. I was poking through the Death Ray website and Austin had made some really cool mecha minis and six millimeter sort of flat uh, terrain for playing in other robot combat games. And I said, well, one of the things I'm really good at is taking like a pile of ingredients and making something out of it. And that actually gets me really excited. I'm kind of the kid that would see a pile of Lego bricks um, that were designed to make one thing and then go and make something else out of it. And I was kind of noodling on the idea already of a quick to play uh, set up and tear down like mecha combat game after having finished my sort of uh, more warband style uh, RPG experience with Gamma Wolves. So with the cool miniatures that he'd already started making in mind, I started putting together a sort of quick to play, quick to design. You still get to like customize and build all your own robots, but then put it down on the table and play a um, sort of like uh, a two player, you know, combat experience with mechs that didn't take a million years to set up and tear down, but felt like satisfying to play and did something different. And that's where Steel Rift came from. So. Um, I uh, wrote the rules in conjunction with Austin's miniatures. Austin designed new miniatures to go along with the rules I was writing. Um, and through that collaboration, we've now got a cool two-player star set that I can show you today. So it is Steel Rift, the modular robot combat game um, for myself and Death Ray Designs. You can see here I've painted up um, some examples of what you can build out of the box. Uh, so the box comes with the Steel Rift little arc gauge here for showing your um, different arcs and where you're being attacked from for engagement orders. Uh, you get a weapon ID chart for all of the cool bits that come in here. You get some decals. Uh, you get the Steel Rift rulebook, which we'll take a closer look at in a second. Uh, and, and this is the exciting part, you get the box itself. And I know normally we don't get excited about the box that stuff comes in, but Austin, being the champion he is, made it also into a carrying case. So not only can you build with these amazing groups of parts, uh, you know, six combat mechs that look like this, either as separate factions like I did to make it a two player box, or you could just build them all and paint them in your own sort of mercenary colors and make your own sort of single player source out of the two player box. Uh, but you get something to carry them in too. It also has room for your dice. Uh, your template will fit in here when you're all said and done. Uh, and if you do decide to magnetize your arms, you could put them in here as well. Uh, you get tons and tons of bits and bobs. So you get the authority chassis, which are all down here. You can see these three guys, uh, two media, sorry, medium, heavy, and a light. Uh, then you get some freelancers as well, medium, heavy, and light. Tons of arm options, everything from like melee arms, through grabby hands, giant mass drivers, tons of weapon pods, either for single or linked weapon systems and their shoulder attachments to go with them, and then piles and piles of the weapons themselves, which you can see here on the chart. That is the intention behind the game. Basically have a big pile of parts, be able to make what you want with them, and either do like I've done here and glue them together in sort of like a final form, or if you want to take a little extra time, throw some magnets in the arm joints there, you could easily swap them in and out. Now, that's not to say that you have to use these miniatures, obviously, to play the game. The idea was that any sort of scale mech models like this could be used. Um, and even if they're on hex bases, uh, Austin has made some very cool base adapters for hex bases to give you the arcs that you need. And you could just easily swap those in and out and convert your models back and forth between games. So that was the idea. Write a game that can be easily played with any miniatures you want. Austin wanted to make a giant pile of... Uh, customizable robot pieces because he was having a super fun time sculpting them and he did a great job and there's even more on the way there's a ton more corporate um, HEV models that you can check out uh, the website already has a bunch more different faction miniatures um, to just kind of dive into the Steel Rift universe so let's take a look at the rulebook so here it is the Steel Rift rulebook now um, the intent behind this was because a lot of mech games require a big chunky huge bunch of rules to play um, i wanted something that would fit in the star set box and did not take up a whole bunch of real estate to play a satisfying game uh, so this is a 40 page rule book um, it was uh, laid out by mike dickens 
uh, designed by um, Mike and myself and Austin, and then copy edited by Hunter Bond, Joe Borowski, Kelly Thompson, and Austin Thompson. Uh, so the biggest sort of like theme here was going to be that you could put together your robots in a satisfying way that was interesting, uh, generate a mission, generate a bunch of off-table assets, arrange your force in a way that felt thematic, have rules to reflect that, and then play for things that reflected both the kind of army that you had, um, or like HEV team that you had, and also the universe you were living in. So. Uh, the rulebook's broken down basically in the order that you do things in, in the game. So uh, you understand the story that you're trying to tell. Uh, the Steel Rift universe is, of course, a uh, universe after an enormous uh, coronal mass ejection knocks out, well, most of what supports the solar system, which has expanded to several planets uh, and lots of different asteroids and sort of mining operations and stuff, uh, and makes it so that the former superpowers of Earth are, who were reliant on the energy they were getting from a Dyson array around the uh, the sun are in a lot of trouble and everyone's vying for resources now and trying to basically keep themselves going in their individual kind of enclaves uh, you then have of course the what you need to play and the game definitions like kind of dice to use um, it's going to be typically d6s for resolving combat and then the other dice sort of polyhedral dice d4 d6 d8 d10 and d12 are used to track both your structure and your armor um, for your max so instead of having to like do a whole bunch of um, like paperwork to design your max. You just flip a die to the facing that you need it, or use the dice size um, for your uh, st structural sort of like tracking and stuff. Uh, use your models, any models you like. Um, Austin, of course, has made some really cool base adapters for uh, you know hexagonal bases on max. But you could also play with anything you want. Any robots that you like to play with, you could play with. And Austin's made, I think, probably one of the coolest customizable um, like selections of robot kits that have been out there in a while. So if you want to convert and make your own mechs and that's something you're excited about, then there's a, there's a huge pile of Lego bricks for you to play with that even just comes in this box. Um, cost, so your cost is basically, anytime cost referred to in the rules, it's a reference to the tonnage of a unit or force. So when you pick your HEV, your mech that you're building, um, they, based on their size, if they're a light, medium, heavy, or ultra heavy HEV, they have a tonnage and that's your budget to then either put armor and, and, and structure reinforcements or even strip them out, uh, pile weapons onto it, additional systems and stuff too. Your bases, uh, which is your base that your model's on, uh, active player, any who is the player currently issuing order for the turn, measuring, uh, you can measure anything at any time and measure um, from base edge to base edge at closest point. If there's no base edge, then measure from the hull to the closest point. Uh, line of sight, a unit can draw line of sight to another unit um, on the table. If an uninterrupted line can be drawn from the nearest point and the front one of their silhouette to one or more sides of the other unit's silhouette along any part of its volume. Uh, silhouette is your volume from the basically the edges of your base all the way to the top of the model itself so it doesn't matter what kind of model you're using basically the top of the tube is the, the height of the miniature and that's what you measure your line of sight from and two and then rolling off roll d6 and reroll ties class that's your size light medium heavy or ultra heavy boards a three by three play area activation markers are placed down um, when you've activated for the turn red line markers are placed down if you pushed an hev um, and then active unit is the hev or support asset performing in order all right it's so getting ready to play you select your mission size now mission size is basically your tonnage budget for your entire hev team um, a recon mission which is you can easily do a recon mission for two teams out of this box set is 100 tons a side a strike which is kind of a standard game size 150 and a battle will be 200 tons um, and then once you're there, you recruit your forces. You're going to break down your um, your force into the number of HEVs you want to take. A light HEV is 20 tons in budget. A medium HEV is 30, and a heavy is 40. So if you build all three of the HEVs on one side of the box set, you've got basically 90 tons built. You can then take a 10-ton support asset um, to take it up to 100 tons and have something off table like an artillery barrage or a tungsten rod falling from the sky or an orbital laser or something like that too. Um, then you load out HEVs. So the individual HEVs basically then get loaded out to make the um, the, the sort of like the, the individual unit that you want to have. And again, you can use this and you can have everything be WYSIWYG. What you see is what you get. But remember, these are six millimeter models. It's easier just to build the model in a cool way. I know a lot of people are going to want to follow this, but Austin and I were super clear when we designed this. Don't, don't worry about it. You can just make the HEV that you want to make that looks cool and then spend your budget however you want and play the game. 
the, the don't stress, make the cool look robot, then worry about the rules afterwards and load them out differently every time if you want. So the first thing you have to do from your budget, so let's say I'm making a medium HEV, it's gonna be um, a total of 30 tons, is I have to assign its armor and its structure, right? So when you start off, you have to pay for that stuff first. Now a light HEV will have uh, six points of armor, a medium will have eight points, and that's a D8. A heavy will have 10, and an ultra heavy will have D12. Um, and then your structure die is going to be for a light a D4, a medium a D6, a heavy a D8, and an ultra heavy is a D10. So you can usually say it's, it's gonna be one less or more. Now you can freely, once you've assigned that die, strip or reinforce each one once. So like, for instance, if you think that the internals on your HEV are a, like a little lighter, um, you could say this medium HEV doesn't have D8 in it, or sorry, D6, it's got D4 in its internals, but I'm gonna push that tonnage then into its armor and reinforce it up to um, a D10 instead. And that allows you to spend that budget back and forth. So out of the 30, once you've assigned its, its structure and its um, armor, a medium HEV would have eight points, eight tons of armor, and then six tons of structure, leaving you with 14 tons total out of your budget. So you'd have 16 tons left and then buy weapons and upgrades and all kinds of other stuff. And that's where you go to next, assign weapon systems and upgrades. Um, and you have a whole bunch of those. Uh, they also have a whole bunch of different traits they could have. So for instance, an auto cannon, um, it has a damage rating of three on a light, four on a medium, five on a heavy, and six on an ultra heavy. That's how many dice you're gonna roll uh, in defense when someone's attacking you with it. And then it has the kinetic trait, which means anytime damage is inflicted by this attack, roll a d6. And add plus one for each class size bigger you are than the target. So the bigger the guns that you're firing, the more kinetic force that it's gonna have. Um, and then uh, subtract minus one for each size but smaller that you are. And then a four plus, rotate the target model 45 degrees away from the active unit in a direction chosen by the active player. So basically you can, you're, 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 you're causing it to stagger basically and um, not present its you know, most, uh, most effective defense when you're hitting it with a kinetic weapon. Now its cost then is three, four, five, and six tons. So if you wanna have a, uh, a light take a auto cannon, you're gonna have to spend three tons of that remaining budget. So if the medium wanted to take one, like I said, I've spent 14, I've got 16 left, another four tons will come off for the first auto cannon. Now, the number of upgrades you can take is based on your size. So a light HEV can have four upgrades or weapons, a medium can have five, a heavy six, an ultra heavy can have up to seven. That includes like things like giving your armor a special trait um, or taking like a target designator so you can call in airstrikes or orbital lasers and stuff like that. Um, or also doubling down on your weapons. So now uh, every time you want to take the same weapon more than once, and this causes, and basically the idea behind this was push a down force on spamming certain weapon types. Um, the more you over specialize something, the more we found in playtesting, it, it became very, very good at doing a specific role and it spamming the same thing over and over again became ideal. There's a increase in the budget cost of 50% each time you take the same weapon more than once. So if you buy that same auto cannon a second time, it costs six tons out of your budget as opposed to just uh, the normal four. Then uh, if you do it again after that, it's gonna cost eight tons. So if you just wanted to have three auto cannons on that medium um, HEV, it would be four the first time, go to six, so 10 for the second time, and then it would go to eight, so 18 the third time. So you wouldn't even be able to afford all of them. But you can also take things like a howitzer, it's an artillery piece with a blast trait, it has a three inch blast when you attack with it um, off of the, the target. Uh, lasers, which have uh, a pretty consistent damage because no matter how big the laser is, um, it's basically burning roughly the same size hole and stuff, uh, but it has the AP trait. And what that is, is once you do, once your damage basically is inflicted the armor, you automatically do that armor to the structure underneath because the laser is just burning directly through, right? It's, it's, it's damaging the internals on something. And as the draining trait, which means you give a red line token automatically because it uses so much of your energy from your fuel, your fuel and energy reserves that you won't be able to red line later on. So you get a red line token and don't get to activate later. Uh, things like missiles can have the smart and limited trait. It means that other uh, HEVs can call them in on targets with a target designator, uh, but it's limited. You only fire it so many turns uh, or times. Particle cannons that have the disruptive rule, which can give people redlining tokens. Now, redlining is a way of acting once you have run out of activation. So if someone activates um, afterwards, you can, you can push yourself for an additional action potentially and take some damage. Rotary cannons, they have the short range. Basically, all guns are unlimited range unless they have... Um, the short rule, which means that they have a limited sort of like effective range. It doesn't mean that the, the, the rotary cannon can't fire at a longer range. It just means it's losing so much kinetic energy as it travels over that distance that it's not doing damage to something as heavily armored as a, a vehicle. 
Um, there might be rules in the future that allows weapons to ignore the short trait. Like for instance, if a softer target presents itself, um, weapons with a short trait can ignore that trait for the purpose of engaging them because the kinetic force is still enough that they can engage. And then things, things like shot cannons, they have the frag rule. It's way harder to defend against them. So when you build the damage pool for it, um, it's harder to get away. So you're, you're penalized to your uh, defense rolls. But it also has the light rule where it takes two successes to do a single point of damage as opposed to one. Basically, you have to pile up a ton of successes, but it, you know, commensurately, it rolls more dice and stuff too. Um, so then once you've done that, you can also add upgrades like Ablet of Armor. So you reduce the attack pool for weapons using the blast trait by one to a minimum of one. So, you know, you just, you have like, extra layers of armor on top and the cost is again commensurate for how big you are. So one for a light, two for a medium, or sorry, one for a, a medium, two for a heavy and two for an ultra heavy. And that's how all costs are presented by class. Uh, you can have optic camouflage and it's of course more, uh, it's more expensive the lighter you are because your defense rolls go down basically depending on how heavy you are. Uh, and then support assets. And these are basically designed to be a catch-all for things that will get added to the game over time, but to start off with in the core rule book, represent things you can't see off the table. So support assets could be anything. They could be infantry, um, you know, like a little platoon of like bikes that follow you around. They could be helicopters. They could be, uh, you know, things flying over drone support, repair drones, all kinds of stuff could be a support asset. But for the core rulebook, it's designed to be the things you can't see. So an artillery barrage, a mass driver, a mine drone barrage, um, or orbital laser. And those are the last 10 tons basically that you can spend. Um, and you can spend it multiple times. You can buy different support assets as well, depending on the game size. So in a recon mission, you can do it once, a strike, you can do it twice. And in a battle, you can select up to three different support assets. Um, of course, the core one you'll probably use mostly in here is going to be the off-table support. Your team basically able to call in stuff from the sky. All right, so your team's put together, you've bought all their upgrades and stuff, now you can buy them uh, or basically get it and set up and get ready to play. So the first step is to determine the approach, and I used a simple table basically to define the battlefield, and there's three different ways, lateral, corner to corner, eight inch deployment, Line breaker, which is a scatter deployment where you have two lines basically uh, diagonal from each other and you have to put at least half your forces in each. And then finally direct, which is a simple three inch deployment zone across from each other. Then you gotta generate your mission objectives and these combine with optional secondary agendas to do your overall scoring. Uh, the first one, security. At the end of each turn, calculate the tonnage of units in each quarter of the mission area. The commander with the most tonnage in that area controls it. The commander that controls the most quarters of the mission area scores a VP. So you can destroy it, then of each turn calculate the tonnage of units destroyed by each commander. The force that has destroyed the most tonnage that turn scores a VP. And then recon, at the end of each turn calculate the total tonnage of units within 12 inches of an enemy deployment edge or corner. The force that uh, has the greatest total scores a VP. So basically, three ways to score primary objectives that are interchangeable with the um, deployment options to give you a bunch of variations in missions. Uh, draws, if commanders are drawn on tonnage for any mission objective, then neither uh, player scores a VP. You generate your terrain, um, starting with the commander that didn't win the approach, alternate placing eight agreed upon pieces or clusters of pieces of terrain in the mission area. Each piece or cluster should be placed outside the deployment zones and the commanders are not within three inches of a previously, previously placed piece of terrain um, or cluster. At least five of the eight pieces should be defined as mostly blocking and impassable, while remaining pieces should be rough and covering. So basically you want some big stuff in the middle to block line of sight. Uh, then you deploy your forces, starting with the commander that chose the approach. Each player takes turns deploying their units one at a time, alternating back and forth. Uh, support assets, if they, this is just future proofing, um, are deployed first, followed by HEVs in the deployment zone, unless otherwise stated off table assets do not count towards the back and forth of deployment. Uh, and then you get, you're playing the game. So there's three steps in the game initiative, which is a roll off, orders, and then resetting. Now, orders are all individual. The active player selects one of their units that it doesn't have an activated token. The unit may perform two orders, after which it is marked with an activated token. The same order may only be performed once per activation and orders can be issued in any sequence. Completed orders um, are resolved and then you perform the next one afterwards. So you have move, jump, lock on, engage, and then smash, which is your melee type order. You can also redline. When a commander would issue an order to make a, uh, to a unit, but all the units have an activated marker, they can choose to redline a unit. They may do so only if the opposing commander still has units without activated tokens. So basically once someone gets like the priority advantage or the, um, the initiative advantage, and then you can do a single order, but when you do so, you also take a single point of damage to your structure. Uh, when you get the redline marker. Commander can uh, may not redline a unit uh, with only a single point of structure remaining, and you may not redline a unit that already has a redline marker. So basically it allows you to push your HEVs a little further, 
expending resources and extra energy or overheating them um, to do extra actions so that one of the things that can happen in a game like this with alternating activation is you get one activation advantage and the activation advantage can become a huge deal um, in who uh, sort of controls the battlefield. Um, so one of the things that people find, um, I think, different about this game so far uh, through the, the Let's Play and the, the playtesters and stuff is the engage order itself, the uh, basically there's two sort of like key things I wanted to make this game different with was that the people with the people taking part in the mission had some agency right so when you're activating you're, you're trying to build the best damage pool for all your weapons you typically do that through maneuvering um, where you're trying to bring your opponent to bear the best uh, the kind of presupposition for this game is that you are piloting a huge walking robot covered in incredibly advanced weaponry you just don't miss. <laughs> if, if you are in an optimal circumstance, it's incredibly hard for a computer targeting device to miss. And I got this idea actually from um, sitting on a plane with my friend Drew and him showing me all of these like future war videos uh, that the Navy generates in the US military where they're like shooting down incoming missiles with these giant defense turrets. And you watch like this minigun on a radar dish basically just like explode incoming missiles going thousands of miles an hour in like three and a half seconds. It just goes and they're just gone. And you're like, you, it, it just doesn't miss. It just hits every, if it, can, if it can predict movement, then it can just hit wherever it wants to hit all the time. And so one of the things I did away with in, in, in this game was the idea that you needed to roll to hit as the active player. You're just trying to bring yourself to bear on this target. And it comes down to the target's ability to enact their defensive systems, either by maneuvering um, defensively or by engaging countermeasures or even by returning fire to disrupt you um, that that generates their defensive reaction, right? So the, the person being targeted actually rolls their defense dice and gets to make decisions like returning fire um, or, uh, or other sort of like general sort of like reactions to being targeted uh, in order to um, in order to defend themselves. And that's, I, that, that is probably the one thing that people kind of have a hard time wrapping their minds around is that you don't, there's no rolling to hit in the game. It's the, it's the target rolling to defend themselves and that your agency during the active turn comes from your, your maneuvering and where you're sort of placing yourself during the turn. Or even where you start the activation and who you choose to have go first. So that was a, that was a, uh, a, a conscious decision to make the game basically feel like these are huge, incredibly advanced fighting machines that while you're operating them, your, your decision is basically how you're applying the weapons and in what order, but the weapons themselves, I mean, in optimal circumstances, they literally just don't miss and it comes down to the defensive countermeasures of the target in order to make them so that they are less effective at destroying you. Um, and it also speeds the game up. It's an unnecessary dice roll, I think, in a lot of missions and there's a lot of games that actually completely do away with the idea of um of to hit rolls or or save rolls or to wound rolls in sort of like the the sort of mechanical process because it's just more steps between resolution and and conflict um, and of course your damage pool is being generated and affected by the table and stuff as well so it's not like there aren't positive and negative modifiers to the result but because those modifiers are uh, basically affecting an overall pool of dice you have the um you have a bunch of choices you can make with your two orders to try and maximize what that dice pool looks like. Now, light and super heavies do have some additional rules for them. Light, uh, light spam during playtesting was a thing that we noticed. Being able to, again, it's about activation control, being able to get as many activations as you can in a game uh, can become something that is powerful. And so um, lights have what are called fragile internals. Doesn't matter if your armor, your armor is your armor, it shrugs off damage. But once you're getting into the substructure of lights, because they don't have as many redundant um, systems and stuff, whenever you take a point of damage to your structure on a light HEV, you roll a die, and on a five plus takes an additional point of damage. And this damage does not in turn result in for further fragile internals, but you can suffer like cascading hits. Um, and likewise, um, for HEVs that are uh, ultra heavy, um, you get to roll a d6 for each point of damage that you take during an attack to your structure on a 5 plus you ignore it and the structure dice isn't reduced. And the idea there was that your, your low and highest end of HEVs were differentiated not just by the value of their armor and structure dice, right? It gave you a, a little just extra layer of reasons to take these really, really heavy guys and reasons not to just spam lots of lights to get activation control. Um, and of course I wanted there to be some melee. Um, and melee to feel different from shooting. So, so shooting is, is fairly simple. Build your attack pool. Um, your defender basically gets some choices. 
uh, and the choice to the damage rating is things like, or sorry, the um, the bonus of the pool is things like plus one of the damage rating at the active units in the side arc of the target units, so the side 90, uh, plus two if they're in the rear, so basically adding dice to the pool, minus one of the damage rating of the weapon if it's a uh, target unit that is not the closest enemy unit in line of sight, right? You're, you're ignoring an incoming threat, um, which is causing your computers to have issues. Uh, and then minus one of the damage rating if this weapon system is targeting a different target than the first weapon system activated during the order. Because all your weapon systems in an engage can target different units if you want. But of course, by focusing, you will get the optimal result. You can split up, but it will reduce your effectiveness. And then minus one of the damage rating if the target has one or more lines of sight. So basically, when you measure from the closest point on your uh, base or silhouette to the opponent, if one or more of the sides of their silhouette is obstructed by... Um, cover or minus two if it's uh, obstructed by blocking terrain. So like a building will reduce your dice pool by two, like woods and stuff like that, if one or more lines is blocked, will reduce by one. Uh, and you can never reduce damage below one, because some things like lasers and stuff have a very low damage rating, but it's because it's it's firing a stick of light, right? Like it's not, it's not a, it's not, it's not Star Wars like beep, 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 like pulsing laser. Lasers in more hard sci-fi are basically a incredibly focused beam. Um, and then the total damage rating is now the attack pool. The target the, uh, unit then rolls the number of d6 is equal to the attack pool. And this is called the defense roll. Apply the falling modifier. So if you are um, a light, you are automatically sort of like more agile and better to, to countermand um, attacks. So you get plus one if you're light, uh, minus one if you're heavy, and then minus two if you're ultra heavy. And then uh, remove all dice from the attack pool that score a four plus after modifiers. So basically your, your defensive dice roll is the damage pool and your failures are things that after modifiers aren't four plus. So an ultra heavy is only evading damage on a six. It's a giant brick wall. Uh, whereas a light could avoid things on a three, four, five or six because it's light. Uh, and then total remaining dice in the attack pool. This is now the damage the target unit receives. Reduce the value of their armor dice by this amount. If it's reduced to zero, deduct any remaining damage from the structure dice. If the structure dice is reduced to zero, the target is destroyed. Uh, if the active unit has any uh, remaining weapon systems, return to the first step. If not, the order is complete. A commander may choose not to activate a weapon system during their order and may activate them in any order. So basically, you apply all your damage things and your opponent's targets will make their defense rolls. Now, Smash, I wanted Melee to feel a little bit different. So Smash is, a, is, is fairly similar, but you determine the damage rating equal to the size of your active unit. So your damage rating for your Smash attack is based on how big you are, right? Um, you are three damage dice for a smash attack if you're a light, four if you're medium, five if you're heavy, six if you're ultra heavy. You get plus one of the damage rating if you're um, if this order was preceded by a move order because you're charging in. Plus two if this order was preceded by a jump order because you're jumping in. Uh, the total damage rating is now the attack pool. The target unit then rolls number of d6 is equal to the attack pool, applying the following modifiers. You get plus one for each size class larger the unit is to the active unit. So like. If you have a light trying to smash an ultra heavy, it just is not as effective at attacking something bigger than it. So interestingly in melee, the bigger you are becomes an advantage defensively versus in shooting it's a, it's a disadvantage because obviously you're just a bigger profile, you're a bigger target to attack. And then minus one for each class size, smaller the unit is to its attack unit. So vice versa, if a smaller thing is being attacked by a larger thing, it can be easier to damage and attack and its save is then sort of penalized. Uh, same as a shooting attack or an engage order, remove all dice uh, from the attack pool that score 4 plus half for modifiers and total the remaining dice in the attack pool. This is the total damage the target knight now receives. Uh, unlike an engage order, apply the smash order um, bit damage differently. So you apply it half basically in a one to one ratio to the armor and structure. And the idea here is when you're doing a smash attack, you're able to attack vulnerable points and you're targeting specific systems um, up close and personal and in a way that can't really be avoided. So for every point of damage you do, you first reduce the armor by one, then the structure by one. Armor, structure, armor, structure, armor, structure. And so while it can be harder to engage in a smash order, the result can be really powerful because typically most HEVs have less structure dice than they do armor dice and you can go directly to their guts basically and start damaging them. Now, speaking of which, once you have critical damage, uh, if a unit receives damage to its structure dice, performance begins to degrade as critical systems begin to fail. Check to see if any of the following apply. If a unit has lost 25% of its structure dice, all move and jump orders are minus one. If a unit's lost 50% of its structure dice, all damage rating for its weapon systems are reduced by one to a minimum of one. And if it's lost 75% of its structure dice, it may only be issued a single order when it's activated. 
Now it's important to note that all of those are cumulative. So once you're down to 75% of your structure dice lost, you have minus one to move and jump orders. All your damage rings reduced by one to movement of one, and you only get a single order. So the thing is limping around. And I want a critical damage to still be a thing in the game, but I didn't want it to be so drastically bookkeeping-y um, that it was like a huge deal basically to keep track of over the course of the game. Uh, and then the last thing is returning fire. So when a commander's unit uh, that is neither an active or red line marker is targeted by an engage order with mutual line of sight, they may choose to declare returning fire. If they do so, they may reroll any natural rolls of one in their defense roll for the remainder of that enemy order. And once the order is complete, if they still have line of sight to the active model, the target unit can immediately interrupt any remaining orders the active unit has left to perform an engage order. Resolve this engage order before processing, uh, proceeding with any remaining orders, and all weapon systems must target the previously active unit during this order. Once it's completed, or if they lose line of sight to the previously active unit due to the effect of a weapon trait, mark the unit returning fire with an activated token. If the previously active unit has orders left to perform, they may do so now. If that completes the active player's turn, they can result. Uh, this can result in the targeted player then immediately activating another unit. So basically, um, returning fire is a defensive boost, but it means that you're forced to then immediately activate them and shoot back after the damage is resolved. So you could also be damaged and have elective, uh, like a, le a less effective return fire. But it does mean that um, there's effectively like an overwatch thing. So if someone's trying to sh engage you and then move away, you have a chance to shoot back basically before they move. Uh, and then ending the game, after the fifth turn, total the number of victory points each commander has scored so far over the course of the game. If one commander has earned that more, then they claim victory. And if the commanders are currently tied for victory points, play a sixth turn. If at the end of the sixth turn, the game will then end, even if it's a draw. So now... That is the core mechanics of the game. We have this lovely color section. You can see some of the new corporate HEVs that are very, very cool. I love these miniatures. Uh, and they're available soon, too. Actually, I think they're available now. Uh, and then this is the brand new section for the core rulebook um, for release. And this is the thing that uh, if you got an advanced copy of this Adepticon this year, uh, will be new to you. Uh, and form up is basically advanced rules for creating your own faction, uh, HEV teams, and playing with secondary objectives. And so the, the, the next part of this, if the core part of the game is build your robots and then play a game with them, the second part is make your team cool and unique. Build your own little faction. And you can do this game by game, or you could write down and sort of write the background for your faction of like space miners, or mercenaries, or pirates, or a corporation, or the old military of Earth, right? You can have whatever you want as your background. Um, and the goal here was, by building your own factions, you can kind of carve out your own little niche, uh, make your color scheme for your HEVs important, or create your own little sort of characterful sort of force to go and have merry adventures. And the goal then was that that, that made your team play slightly differently and feel slightly different. So after you've uh, learned the core rules for Steel Rift, you may choose to enhance your games by selecting a type of faction for your team to be affiliated with. Once you've selected a faction, you can personalize your entity by selecting two faction perks, to help customize the identity of your backer. You may not select more than one perk from each grouping. Combining them in different ways will allow you to give your faction a distinct personality on the battlefield. Um, and in addition to your faction's perks, you will gain a secondary agenda based on the faction uh, your force belongs to. And then secondary objectives are detailed further on page 35. So we have three different uh, core factions here. The authorities, so like old earth governments, government of Mars, uh, some of my examples are like the United Nations, NATO, the Eastern Bloc, NASA, the ESA, United Allies Security, CSA, United Martian Space Agency. Some of these are made up, obviously. Uh, corporations, the economic monsters of the solar system, so like Solar Transit and Shipping, Big Biopharma, the Solar Belt Food and Trade Conglomerate, Energy Inc., and Lockheed Mao. Uh, and then the last one is the freelancers. So the unpredictable agent provocateurs of solar history. So people like spacers, miners, salvage crews, rogue scientists, solar explorers, criminals, and mercenaries. Um, and they operate slightly differently from the other ones. So the authorities, basically you have three tables of perks to choose from. You can combine any two, but you can't take two from the same table. So like you could have a military uh, protectivist group, right? So uh, your military training could be coordinated assaults once per game after you've activated an HEV, but not a support asset or unit. You can remain the active player and immediately activate a different HEV that does not have an activated marker. They may only complete a single order, but you then play then passes as normal. So basically you get the jump with somebody else once per game. And then make them protectivists. In any mission that requires calculation of tonnage, the mission area during a turn, all allied HEVs are considered to be five tons heavier for determining which commander achieves the objective. In any mission that requires calculation of tonnage destroyed during a mission, any enemy HEVs which are more than 12 inches away from all friendly deployment zones and that took damage that turn count as five tons destroyed each. So basically you're very protective of your territory. Um, and you like to coordinate your, your assaults. And, and the idea here is you could also then maybe take something like 
military training, the elite pilot program, and give yourself orbital stockpiles. So off-table support assets with a limited trade have their value increased by one. You get an extra shot with off-table support. Um, and the elite pilot program, once per game turn, after the opposing commander selects a uh, unit to activate and declares their order, you can rotate a single HEV up to 90 degrees. You can turn to face somebody because your pilots are so elite. Um, and then basically mixing and matching these allows you to create a name and create sort of like a personality profile for your forces and everybody gets access to those perks. Then your faction secondary agenda, territorial, score of EP if there's no active enemy units within 10 inches of any of your deployment edges or corners at the end of the mission. So basically you can take that as your secret agenda and you, whenever you have secondary agendas, and I'll go through those in a bit, um, you get a pool of ones to choose from because you could also have them from your team selection. Uh, you basically pick one for the mission, uh, depending upon the game size. Corporations, they have uh, espionage, research and development, and deep war chests as their core traits that they can choose from. So for espionage, you'd have paid saboteurs. Any off-table support assets taken by any commander have their limited trait reduced by one to a minimum of zero. So your paid saboteurs and your orbital stockpiles could basically counter each other out if you played against each other. And you can combine that with things like top-end hardware. During force creation, and all allied HEVs receive two additional tons to spend on weapon systems and upgrades. These tons do not take them over their class tonnage of spent and are not counted for any other game purpose other than what the HEV is equipped with. Basically, you're just you know, you're very advanced robots and so you get two extra uh, tons to, to play with. Um, you could also do things like um, research and development, advanced hardpoint design. Uh, during force creation, all allied HEVs have one additional slot for weapon systems and upgrades. And then maybe purchased outcomes. Uh, once per game, when the enemy commander declares an order, you may cancel it. The order still counts as having been issued for the purpose of any traits or limitations of use, but it has no effect and is not resolved. Just once per game, you can just be like, no, your guy doesn't do that because you bribed him. Because you, you sent him a picture of his family and said it would be terrible if something happened to them. Um, and, and these perks basically are designed to add another layer of like tactics and stuff. Now the freelancers, um, they have an additional uh, big league origin table. So they have rogue agency and underworld affiliations as their first like sort of two traits they can pick from. But then Big League Origins allow you to take a uh, trait from the other two. They can be from authorities or corporations and kind of let you mix and match in there as well. So Rogue Agency is things like um, Reckless Piloting, once each game turn. When you have the option to redline an HEV, you may take two points of structural damage instead of one and perform two orders instead of the usual one. Uh, heavy reactors can reduce this damage as normal. So basically you could take a, an additional full order with, or reaction with somebody. Um, your underworld affiliations are things like tech pirates during forest creation. Select one research and development perk from the corporate faction to apply to your freelancers for this mission. And then big league origins are things like ex-military veterans. Prior to deployment, select one of the military training perks from the authority faction. Um, and that's prior to deployment. So you could actually change that one game by game because you're military veterans. And then political extremists, select one political priority perk from the authorities faction to apply to your freelancers. Or Disgraced Trillionaire, select one deep war chest perk from the corporate faction to apply to your freelancers, because you're a disgraced trillionaire. <laughs> and their faction uh, secondary agenda is score one VP at the end of the mission. If over the course of the game, two or more enemy HEVs were destroyed during an order, where you were the active player under the effect of one of the following perks, either unpredictable gambits, reckless piloting, network hackers, or intimidation tactics. So basically when you play to your strengths over here. Uh, and now it's HEV team. So now you've got like your faction basically that you're from. You can design your own faction. You can also um, put your guys together into special teams. And the teams basically give you different perks depending on your composition. So this encourages you to compose your HEVs in different ways. Take them in sort of like thematic groupings and then unlock bonuses because of it. So um, the number of teams you can include in your forces depending on the game size. So the number of teams of two can be one in a recon. So you can have up to one two-man team. Uh, the number of teams of two to three in a striker battle could be two, and the number of teams of two to four is one in a battle. So in a full battle, you can have a full four-man team if you want with all the advantages. In a standard strike game, you can have up to two teams, um, a single team of two, and up to two teams of two to three. And then uh, those teams all have different bonuses and requirements. So the first table is requirements, the second table is based on your team size, what your bonuses could be. So for a fire support team, they're trained to bombard the enemy. You have to have at least one um, light HEV and one heavy, uh, a medium or heavy. And then the light has to have a target designator and the medium or heavy has to have one of the following, a rocket pack missile or howitzer, their requirement. Because you have to be a fire support guy. And then 
Uh, team size, there's no bonus for the light, but the medium or heavy gain plus one of their limited trait because they've been equipped properly. If you have a three-man team, the lights all gain uh, target designators don't use an upgrade slot, and then howitzers gain the smart trait. You can call them in. And then for four, target designators have their cost reduced to zero for all the lights, and for medium or HEV, uh, then all rocket packs and missiles gain plus one of their limited trait. So these are all cumulative as well. So basically, the bigger your team size is, you unlock all five of these perks. So a four-man team with a fire support, um, you can have up to uh, two of each, two lights and two medium or heavies, like with the, the, the ordinance to call in. Your target designators and the lights don't take up a slot and don't cost anything. And you have plus two to all your limited traits for your heavies and mediums. And they've all got the smart trait on their howitzers. Now it also unlocks the team secondary agenda, which is far for effect. At the end of the mission, score a VP if two or more enemy HEVs have been destroyed while resolving a weapon system, actively using the smart trait for line of sight. So basically, if you call in and destroy something uh, twice per game uh, using the smart trait with your, basically playing to the strengths of your fire support team, you get an extra bonus VP. And considering most of the core missions, there's a maximum of five VPs on the table. This could tie break if both sides score them, or push somebody over the edge, or even create a tie for someone who might be losing. Uh, recon team, you have to have at least one light, up to four. They all have to have a target designator. And then mediums or heavies, you can have zero to two, and they have to have a target designator as well, and must have both their armor and structure stripped. They must be lighter than normal. Um, for the teams of two, they get electronic countermeasures, uh, not having a, not taking up a slot. And for medium or heavies, if one or more HEVs from this team is within 18 inches of an enemy deployment edge or corner, you gain plus one to the initiative roll. So basically, once those guys get in, they can they can recon and give you bonuses to see who goes first each turn. For a three-man team, um, your target designators don't uh, take up an upgrade slot, and up-table support assets get plus one to their damage rating for mediums and heavies. Uh, and then for light HEVs, electronic countermeasures and target designators have their cost reduced to zero. And when determining the origin of attack for an off-table support asset directed by a member of this team, it can be from any direction. So you have to have these composing your team to gain these bonuses. And their uh, secondary objective is death from above. At the end of the mission, score a VP if two more enemy teams were destroyed by resolving off-table assets called in using a target designator from this team. So if they manage to kill something with the orbital lasers and stuff, then you can score bonus VPs. Uh, security team, it's at least one medium and one heavy, up to uh, four mediums, uh, two heavies, and up to zero to two uh, ultra heavies. Uh, they have to have at least one armor or plating upgrade for all of them, and they may never be stripped. Basically, these are a security team. They're the, the, big, the big brawlers. Uh, teams of two, armor or plating upgrades don't take up upgrade slots uh, for lights, mediums, and heavies. And then their secondary objective is things like don't give an inch. At the end of the mission, score a VP if there are more friendly HEVs uh, than enemy HEVs within 12 inches um, of your deployment zone or edge. If the case of multiple corners, there must be a friendly HEV in range of all of them for the enemy to be scored. So basically, you need to have more friends standing within range of your zone than enemies because you kept them back. And then finally, a tactical team. Uh, it has to have at least one of everything. One medium, one heavy, uh, and one uh, light. And then the light has to have a target designator. Um, the medium has to have a melee weapon, and the heavy has to have a rocket back or missiles. At the end of the mission, score additional VP on turns uh, two or three if you're forced to score VP from the primary mission objective. So basically, if in the middle of the game you're getting your primaries going, you get to have a bonus for mission momentum. And then secondary uh, agendas basically are formed into a pool. After the mission's been generated, both commanders will now generate their pool of possible secondaries. This will be determined by... Their forces faction, any teams they've included in their force, any support assets they or their opponent have selected. And each commander may reveal their pool of secondary agendas openly. This includes any secondary objectives that they may make available to the enemy commander because of support assets they've selected. Then in secret, both commanders may select a number of secondary agendas up to the maximum allowed by the mission being played. So in a recon, you can have one. In a strike, you can have two. In a battle, you can have three. Uh, secondaries are only revealed at the end of the mission to check if they've been completed or not. If a secondary agenda has a numerical condition it tracks, such as destroying enemy HEVs, um, you, you still need to track it. Just do this by not identifying the agenda, but just putting a dice next to the table. And they're just additional paths to victory for a commander, so select them wisely. And that's it. So more ways to play the game, more things to play for, uh, your own faction creation rules, and being able to divvy up into teams was the core thing added to the rule book. And I'm really happy with this book. It's concise. It lets you tinker with everything. 
um, and it gives you a whole bunch of sandbox to play with. I wanted something that was lean, quick to play, and fit right in the starter set, and man, did the layout guys and Austin, yeah, Austin and Mike uh, did an amazing job of creating something I think that looks really good and is going to be perfect just to put next to the table when you play your games and not take up too much real estate. So there it is, Steel Rift, the two-player starter set of Modular Mecha Combat. Um, I am pumped for all of this. Uh, and um, I think that the, the value of the box is really good. There's tons of like building uh, and sort of like creation fun to have in making your HEVs. Uh, the models themselves turned out fantastic. And the amount of different customization options with just how many guns you get in here, how many different arm sets. Uh, is gonna be great. And I love that Austin made the case. That was something I wasn't expecting. I love that you made the box set so that you actually get to contain your miniatures inside and store them to go and play your games and everything, including your dice, right? You can put a measuring gauge in here, you can put your dice in here, put your rule book in here, and be ready to rock and roll. So there it is. The two-player starter box for Steel Rift by Deathray Designs and myself. I'm really excited to play it. I can't wait for people to get this in their hands. I'm free to play some more with my friends and to start working on expansions. So big thanks for watching. Thanks, Alan Nash. Have a good one. Hey there, I hope you enjoyed that video. There are tons of other games already recorded for you to watch. Click over to my channel page if you haven't already and have a look to the dozens of playlists full of videos. I guarantee you'll discover a game you haven't seen played before. I put out new videos seven days a week and every day is themed to a different genre as I continue to explore the wider world of gaming. Of course, none of that's possible without you, the viewer, so click a like and subscribe if you'd like to stay on top of what's happening here daily. My two kids and I are massively grateful to be able to have the flexibility of this job so I can always maximize my time with them. If you want to support me continuing to put out this content, it's only possible because of my amazing backers on Patreon who support the studio, equipment, and model cost, as well as being how I make the bulk of my living. You can also help out by buying a t-shirt through Spreadshirt, a measuring gauge or widget from Deathrite Designs, or buying one of my games and supplements like Last Days, Gamma Wolves, and Blaster. As a way of showing my appreciation, patrons get early access to new games and supplements that I write throughout the course of the year. Huge thanks for watching, it really does help out, and happy gaming.